denizens of the night. Welcome to another episode of the macabre, the terrifying. Broadcasting live from the service corridor of a long abandoned shopping mall, I will be your guide through the witching hours. Tonight we'll do a little bit of exploring, or rather, We'll meet a group of friends who inadvertently find themselves in an unknown place within a shopping mall. But are they really still in the shopping mall? Or did they wind up someplace nobody was ever supposed to see? This story is called The Back Rooms and was written by Reddit user your D and D guy. It's late September. You remember these nights? Humid, muggy, just a hint of the coming fall. Too cold for a t-shirt, but too warm for a sweater. These are the nights best spent at Cook Place Community Mall in my modest Midwest hometown. A diamond in the rough in my eyes, this shopping center is a break from the monotony of tired hardware stores and family grocers that lined Main Street. The Cook Place Mall is typically packed to capacity. But not tonight, because it was 8.15 on a Tuesday night, 45 minutes until close. Not exactly prime window shopping hours. Despite that, my three friends and I were still going strong. We were ending the night in the dusty arcade located in a basement of the shopping mall. It was down a short flight of stairs between the Dairy Queen and Sabaro in the food court. Faded and flickering carnival lights lined the dimly lit hallway and steps. Andy, do you have another quarter? Philip, my youngest friend, questioned as the words game over splattered across the screen. Philip was twelve years old and a bit underdeveloped for his age. Andrew, his older brother, my best friend, and my biology partner, scowled as he rummaged through his pockets in vain. Maybe if you... I was hoping to spend it on a Coke tomorrow before class started. Clay, a guy Andy and I had just met in biology, had clearly been waiting for this moment. A few loose Honestly, quarters left in my yeah, pocket. Yeah, guys, it's getting a bit but late. That was gonna I think I'm going to bounce. Got to study for our exam on cellular reproduction. The exam wasn't for a week yet, but I wasn't bothered. Clay had been acting a bit ambivalent since we got to the mall. Seemed he wasn't a huge fan of having Philip around. Cramped his style or whatever. I didn't care. Philip was pretty much like a brother to me, so he came first. Philip having realized there would be nary a quarter for him, gave up aimlessly pressing buttons on the greasy machine. I have to go to the bathroom. Didn't you just go? sighed Andy. Yeah, but we had a large soda. You had a large soda, kid. By the time I got a sip, it was all backwash. I chuckled as Andy and Philip started away from the arcade machines. Clay, while texting followed lazily behind them. It was 8.24, and we'd located a bathroom. The bathroom we were used to using in the mall, on the way out the front door, was closed for renovations, so we had to find another one. An L-shaped hallway, lit with yellow humming fluorescent lights, ended with a corresponding bathroom on either side of the hall, with custodial equipment blocking the women's entrance. Philip rushed into the restroom. The mall closed at 9 o'clock p.m., so we were going to need to get moving. Sure enough, as the thought crossed my mind, the rattly old mall intercom crackled to life with a ding-dong. An adolescent male's voice spoke sharply. Mall closing in 30 minutes. Mall closing in 30 minutes. I checked my watch. It was 826. Huh. <laughs> Someone's in a hurry to get out of here tonight. I thought. <laughs> That's retail. Clay spoke up. I might just get going, you guys. I live pretty close to here. I'm, I'm just going to walk instead of the bus. Good night. 
Night, Clay, we said in unison. He turned his back and walked away, turning right to depart the mall. Andy and I looked at one another. I don't know, kind of a wet blanket. He seemed really cool when I met him, Andy explained. Nah, he was okay. Maybe just a bit quiet. The texting was a bit annoying, though. Our attention was drawn to the sound of a flush from the bathroom. Andy's face twisted into a mischievous grin. Hey, we should give Philip a little fright when he comes out. Remembering how jumpy Philip tended to be, I felt a pang of guilt. It really wasn't very nice to spook him, and we did it often. Nevertheless, I stood on the other side of the door, opposite Andy, waiting for Philip to step between us, not expecting a thing. The door swung open. Philip stepped out into the hallway, focused on drying his hands on his pants. He stepped by, none the wiser. Ah! Andy yelled as we each grabbed a shoulder. Philip yelled as he twisted around and fell backwards. Philip fell into the wall. And then Philip fell into the wall. That's the only way I know how to describe it. One moment, he'd slipped off his feet and crashed into the wall. The next, everything but his legs had gone through the wall, as if there were a perfectly shaped hole in the concrete. Philip's legs spasmed in the air in the same looping, spastic pattern for but a few seconds. And then there was nothing left but solid concrete. What? I... Andy stuttered as he fell to his knees, his face a mixture of curiosity and confusion. As he shuffled towards the wall, his face turned to fear. I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand. Philip? He shouted his brother's name with a desperate, wavering cry. Philip! He slammed his hands into the wall. Once, twice, not a third time. Andy's head now protruded from the wall, facing the ceiling. His head seized from side to side as he continued to scream for his brother. God, he sounded like he was yelling through a box fan. I stepped backwards as my best friend disappeared from sight, and I was left with his scream bouncing off the hallway walls, intensifying as it mixed with the hum of the fluorescent lights. The howl of the fluorescent lights. My back pressed against the bathroom door, and I jumped. I screamed as my world exploded with static, deafening and blinding me. The noise was unbearable, and the grain obscured everything. And all at once, it stopped. I clutched my head in my hands, eyes squeezed shut. The static had dissipated, but was replaced with the hum of fluorescent lights and the all-too-familiar yellow glow through my eyelids. But there was something new, a smell that hadn't been there before, the musty, wet smell of carpet. Carpet that should have been changed decades ago. The smell reminded me of the dilapidated bowling alley down the road from the mall. I opened my eyes. Before me was the bathroom hallway, as expected, lit by the same light as before. The bathroom doors were gone. There were no more doors. No more custodial equipment. Just a smooth slab of concrete wall. I got to my feet and looked around me cautiously. It seemed I was still in the mall, but it was quiet. It felt different. The fluorescent hum buzz was too loud. My ears itched. I walked down the hallway in the direction of the food court. As I turned the corner, I was met with not the opening to the food court as expected, but by another abrupt 90-degree corner, turning to the left. Ding dong! I froze. The loudspeaker was engaged. The dead air coming from the speaker nearest me told me that, but the operator had nothing to say. After a motionless moment, what felt like hours, 
The microphone snapped back into the console, cutting the empty noise. Whomever had activated the speaker seemed to have hung up. Confused and growing ever more frightful of where I'd found myself, I turned the corner. I was met with a large, empty room that I had never seen before. It was about the size of a classroom, with stained concrete walls. The smell of must was even stronger in here. Each wall had an identical rectangular door-shaped opening that seemed to be placed at randomly decided positions along the wall. The popcorn ceiling, littered with smears of dirt and greasy imprints, had long cracks spanning it. The room was clearly in need of renovation. I don't understand, I muttered out loud. I truly didn't. This featureless room served no purpose other than a passageway to these other rooms. The lack of planning and absent attempt at caring for the room made me feel as if this place was long forgotten. I might as well try the next room, I thought to myself as I walked through the door to my left. The room I found myself in was as bleak and unrecognizable as the last. From my glance, the only difference in style was that this room was shaped like a triangle. I heard a single cry from my right. It was more of a whimper, actually. What the fuck? It was Clay's voice. It couldn't be Clay. I watched him leave the mall. I rushed through the door to find Clay lying in the fetal position in a long hallway, stretching a distance to my left and right. Change the channel! Change, change the channel! Clay babbled incoherently as he sobbed on the floor. Clay? Clay, you gotta get up! Clay didn't respond to me. He never would. His eyes, wide and unblinking with fear, were glued to the floor. How can fluorescent lights be so damn noisy? And then I saw it, and then I felt it. It hung motionless in the air, feet lightly scraping the ground. It had dry, cracked skin that was dressed loosely with torn, rough-spun shorts. It had the torso of a man, but its torso was on the wrong way. Its frail and feeble arms outstretched to the ceiling, not quite reaching, as if in an act of surrender. It had a cocked head, as if confused, as it peered down the hallway at me. Dark, beady eyes stared widely at me through the holes in the bloody duct tape wrapped around its head. And then it started to float toward us. Every time I blinked, Stunned in absolute terror, it was not where I expected. A few feet forward, some inches to the left, never where it should be. And yet, it was getting closer, ever closer. What I saw next will follow me forever. I turned to run, breaking the stillness, and sprinted down the hallway. I don't know, I... Guess I just assumed Clay would follow in the moment. I was wrong. A blood-curdling screech shook the hallway, and I whipped around. It had reached Clay. He still wasn't looking, but he was certainly screaming. It extended its long, spindly arms and cradled him like a child. But it wouldn't look away from me. No, its eyes never left mine. In one quick, jerking motion, it was holding Clay by the top of his head, palming him like a basketball. I blinked, and it had grasped Clay's arm with its free hand. With brute strength, it twisted Clay by the torso. Clay's screaming cut short with a fleshy crunch as he dropped to the floor in a twisted pile. His eyes had finally opened, to look at me one last time. And then I screamed. The louder I screamed, the louder the fluorescent hum became. Which was louder, I couldn't tell. 
I turned and ran to the first door I saw, blindly twisting and turning through the rooms that followed. Why on earth does every room look the same? I turned a corner and ran face first into a dark mass. We both fell to the floor. Andy! How did you get down here? Where the hell are we? I don't know, Andy. Where's Philip? We have to get him right now and leave. We turned and rushed down a third hallway, perpendicular to the hallway Andy and I met in. We ran until we felt we could run no more and then fell into a final doorway. We landed in a mass on the damp floor and quickly scuttled to the back wall. The hum of the lights was all we could hear. Louder and louder. And then they all went out. Silence. We found ourselves in total darkness and total silence as we clutched each other. No, wait. Not total silence. The sound of static, as if emitting from a television, slowly coming toward us. Only when the light, coming from the source of the noise, started to slowly illuminate the room, did I realize. This room had only one door. It floated around the door frame, toes dragging on the floor as it cast its bloody eyes upon us. Andy and I, mute with fear, stood against the wall. Andy moved himself in front of me. It floated towards us. Andy raised his arms. It reached out for us. Leave us alone! Ding dong! We all became statues. We locked eyes with it as we listened to the intercom crackle to life. Shallow, rapid breathing came through the speaker. Andy! It was Philip. With a guttural scream, Andy lunged towards it. I fell backwards into the wall, and I landed inside of a trash can. What? I was inside a trash can, filled with the refuse from a full day of food court disposal. Kid, what are you doing in there? I looked out to see a very confused elderly janitor, wondering why a young man was taking a Sabaro bath after mall hours. It was 9.32 p.m. At least that's what the clock over the water fountain said. The water fountain? I'm back in the mall. Oh, sorry. I was just hungry. And I ran. In the following years, I would try to make sense of what happened in that back hallway. I even went so far as to return there and try to access that place, but to no avail. I never found a thing, but I kept trying until they demolished the mall a year later. Philip and Andy's parents weren't really present when they were around, so they didn't make much of a deal on TV when they were interviewed, despite the media trying to fire them up. They just seemed like it was the final straw to send them to total apathy. Last I heard, Clay's parents moved out of town but were paying exorbitant P.I. bills to find their son. After a few years of half-assed detective work and a few rotations of milk cartons, Andy and Philip were forgotten by our sleepy little town. But sometimes, when I'm going to sleep, I remember. And I leave the TV on Channel 3. There's nothing broadcasting on that channel, but the static helps me sleep. Each time I hear about this empty and dangerous place called the Back Rooms, I'm reminded of the OG Back Rooms from the way back. Can you guess what the first instance of the Back Rooms was? If you guessed Theseus and the Minotaur, you'd be correct. In that story, 
The architect Minos builds a labyrinth so complicated that no one can escape it. And just to be sure they don't, he turns loose a monster inside. The Minotaur! Can you imagine being trapped in a maze while the hulking footsteps of a monster echo off the walls around you? You can't be sure if they're coming from behind or ahead. So each time you turn the corner, the beast could be right there. Yes, it reminds me of our unlucky teenagers. At least our protagonist escaped, but I get the feeling they didn't get away unscathed. If you enjoyed tonight's story, check out the author in the links below. And don't forget to leave a like on this video and subscribe for more hair-raising tales like this one. Be careful which hallways you go down in the mall, and don't fall asleep. <laughs>